I think we will get started. I'd want to be able to let uh, Andy use the time. So welcome to the uh, college research seminar. And I'm Marie Harvey, Associate Dean for Research. And it is delighted, delightful to see so many people here in person. This is a hybrid. We have people coming in that are going to be online. So uh, when we come to Q&A, we'll accommodate people in the room and those who are in the Zoom chat room. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Sean Newsom, who is associate professor in the kinesiology program, and uh, he will introduce today's speaker and he'll moderate the session. So take it away, Sean. Thank you. Good. Okay, I think Marie covered, uh, thank you very much, by the way, uh, covered most of the housekeeping, but uh, for those of you who are not in the room with us, I've been told to tell you that your microphones have been muted. Apologies and thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function on Zoom. We will surely read any questions that you have for Dr. Pitchford uh, at the end of the session. So uh, I'll try to remind you all at the end to do that, but again, use that Q&A feature. Okay, so with that being said, who is our presenter? That is Dr. Andy Pitchford. He is a recent, recently joined faculty member in the kinesiology program, but I'm gonna tell you how he got here. And uh, please let me know if you can notice a theme. So uh, Dr. Pitchford began his undergraduate education in physical education at the University of Michigan. Uh, he then completed his master's degree in movement studies and disability, and that may be a throwback name for some people who are familiar with this program, here at Oregon State University. He crossed paths with many of our current faculty, some of you are in the room. Uh, he then went on to pursue doctoral training at the University of Michigan, uh, where he ran across several other faculty, such as myself and our, uh, uh, what is the appropriate title, school head, Megan McDonald. Uh, so Andy has a lot in common with, with quite a few of us. Uh, I'm thoroughly convinced as a result that he got lost on his way back to Oregon because he spent a few years as an assistant professor at Iowa State University uh, before recently joining us back here in Corvallis. So we are delighted to have him. Uh, Dr. Pitchford is a certified adapted physical educator. He is also a clinical director of health promotion for Special Olympics in the states of Michigan, Iowa, and I believe soon to be Oregon. Um, the focus of his work is on explaining relationships of physical activity, motor behavior, and health in populations with disabilities. So with that being said, thank you so much for presenting today, Andy. Look forward to hearing about your work. Thank you very much, Sean. Appreciate that. Give me a few minutes to get this. Okay, well, thank you all for coming, especially to um, the group that's here in, in person on such a nice Friday to be uh, indoor, indoors for a talk like this. Uh, I am Dr. Amy Pitchford. I will be talking about uh, physical activity and health promotion for people with intellectual disabilities through the Special Olympics. So for those of you who might not be familiar with Special Olympics, you might know the name but not really know what the organization is responsible for. Uh, Special Olympics is a sporting organization specifically targeting uh, people with intellectual disabilities. And their vision is to provide an inclusive world for all driven by the power of sport through which people with in intellectual disabilities. Uh, I guess I'm just going to move in. Oh, sorry. To the inside, just a little closer. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. Oh, oh. Is it otherwise? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Not accustomed to not being heard while speaking. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I was saying, uh, Special Olympics um, is the, the goal is through sport to create an inclusive world for people with intellectual disabilities to live active, healthy, and fulfilling lives. And they do that through the mission of providing year-round sports training and competition with goals of improving of physical fitness, uh, encouraging opportunities to show courage, and to experience joy. 
Uh, and this is done on a global scale. Um, there are over 5 million athletes that participate uh, in Special Olympics each year. That number obviously went down during the COVID pandemic, but it's coming back up. Special Olympics has a presence in 201 countries, and every year there are over 100,000 competitions, over a million volunteers supporting Special Olympics, and something I'm going to be talking about today, over 175,000 health screenings provided to those athletes. And over the last 15 years, I've had uh, a range of experiences with Special Olympics, starting off as a coach, um, an advocate for my students in adaptive physical education, and then as a clinical a, a director of health promotion, where I bring my students from a university, train them, and we provide health screening and education to athletes at events. Um, we have some images here of uh, coaching and uh, supporting through those health screenings. So the goals of Special Olympics currently, while we think of them as a sporting organization, are much broader and wider than just let's play a sport. Um, some of the current strategic goals that Special Olympics have um, revolve around kind of these four areas where trying to reduce the prevalence of disease among people with intellectual disabilities by promoting uh, physical well-being, um, promoting the social and emotional well-being of people with intellectual disabilities, and particularly around relating to the stressors that they experience in their communities, developing an inclusive mindset and behavior among the general public on accepting people with in intellectual disabilities and creating inclusive environments, um, and then working with other organizations to improve their cultures of inclusion. Um, and that also includes training athletes to be advocates for themselves in the community um, to gain um, access to organizations and systems that might benefit their overall lives. So we can kind of group Special Olympics programming into four areas. Um, sport is at the, the center of it. Special Olympics is about training to compete in, in sport. But around that, there are activities that relate to the education of people, to promoting leadership, and to promoting health. And while I can't talk about all of the programming that Special Olympics does because it's far too diverse for, for 40 minutes, I'm going to try to talk about two areas in which I've been involved and show some of the research data that we've generated. And that is going to include the Healthy Athletes Program, where I'm a clinical uh, director, um, as well as the Play Unified Program, um, which is an inclusive sport uh, promotion um, in which we're, we're partnering athletes with and without intellectual disabilities on the same teams, on the same fields, competing together. Um, and I will get to that in a second. So starting off with Healthy Athletes. Um, Special Olympics, in addition to being a sporting organization, has become the largest international public health organization, specifically for people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, the Healthy Athletes Program was started in 1997. Um, it actually started off um, related to vision with a donation in partnership with the Lions Club to be able to provide uh, vision screenings and prescription eyewear to athletes at events. It has since now grown into a multidisciplinary um, health promotion uh, activity in which um, since that time, over 2 million health screenings and education have been provided to athletes with intellectual disabilities. And in doing so, over 300,000 health professionals and students have been trained on how to better include or meet the needs of people with intellectual disabilities in their own practices, which I actually think might be the, the bigger outcome from all of this, this work. In doing so, all of the data that comes from these health screenings um, has been used to create what we call the Healthy Athlete System, which is a large international database of health indicators, specifically of athletes, um, thus with intellectual disabilities. And while I think there is general consensus among the research community, I'm going to highlight 
a couple of my colleagues, Megan Floyd, John Foley, Vivian Temple, who have been really on the foreground of using this database to better understand health. This database presents us with an amazing opportunity to understand health disparities and health conditions among people with intellectual disabilities. But given the size and the scope of it, it still has not been, it's been relatively underutilized. So part of what I'm gonna show is some of the work that um, uh, has used that, as well as talk about some of the directions that are going to improve its use in the future. So healthy athletes consist of eight different sub-disciplines. Um, I'll kind of go around. We have healthy hearing, which is audiology. Fit feet is, is podiatry. MedFest is where sports of uh, physicals um, are conducted. Fun fitness is um, at, um, areas related to uh, physical therapy. Health promotion um, is the area that I'm involved with and has been a clinical director for the last 10 years. It's also the worst name out of all of these. Um, I've been trying to push for healthy habits or something uh, that's a little more catchy, but we're still health promotion. Um, <laughs> there's the original section um, uh, sponsored by the Lions Club of Opening Eyes. That is a, a vision, special smiles is dentistry. And then the newest um, uh, area is called Strong Minds and is a mental health uh, component to the program. So I just can't talk about all of these. So the data that I'm going to highlight here today comes from two areas, health promotion of which I'm uh, directly involved as well as the fun fitness or the physical therapy uh, component of Special Olympics. So what do we know about athlete health based off of this database? Well, the one area that has been mined the most is obesity. We as part of health promotion collect height and weight that can be used um, to um, turn into BMI and a classification. And the, I would say 95% of the data that has been published in scholarly journals has related to obesity. Uh, the most recent paper, one of the most recent papers, um, was a look at um, internationally what um, over obesity and underweight looked like within this population. Their particular analysis related to uh, the income level of the country. And what we um, see from this is that the odds of an athlete being obese are substantially higher in high income countries those in uh, North America compared with those in uh, low income. And that's not uh, surprising, the same characteristics or the same trends exist in the general population. Um, but we are seeing that our uh, areas to address obesity can't be targeted the same in every region of, of the world. And certainly the high income uh, and the uh, North American countries are um, the uh, most prominent. But I think overall what this states is that internationally, we see obesity rates of 35 to 40%, which is a staggeringly high number. And if we go into individual areas, sometimes we see rates that get closer to 70%. Um, so this is clearly a very common, very problematic health issue in this population. A new area that comes with data from the fun fitness um, uh, discipline is looking at muscular strength. Um, and so this is an example of a recent study that looked at the grip strength of athletes. And what we're seeing um, in this graph is a comparison of male and female athletes um, across, again, those income countries. Um, and we see somewhat the opposite of a relationship here in that we see higher mean group strength, so better muscular strength among those high and upper middle uh, income countries than we do in the lower middle to low countries. So there's still, these are just two examples of ways in which this data can, can be used. And what is for my discipline and the work that, that I do, what's most impressive about this is to have thousands of data points instead of having 15 data points allows you to do very different things than what's often done in the field of adaptive physical education and adaptive
So what I'm primarily want to talk about is a study that was recently published uh, by myself and my <coughs> former master student, uh, Morgan Cleveringa, and I have to give her um, all of the credit for this. This uh, was a master's thesis that occurred during COVID and when our in-person um, uh, study was no longer possible. Uh, we went and found some secondary data for her to use, and I think uh, it has set off a chain of future studies that I was not necessarily anticipating when we pivoted um, to get through the pandemic. So what we did was looked at indicators of muscle strength, of bone density, and of body mass index um, across adult special Olympics athletes, this happens to be in the United States, um, and have been, we're, we're able to extend how this data could be used in a couple of, of ways. Um, trying to get more um, detail on the aging process that appears to be going on as these um, athletes appear to age at a faster progression than we would expect in the general population. And for the, what I believe I'm aware of is the first time, combining disciplines of health promotion and fun fitness into the same um, analysis, which had not been done before. So we took data from the health promotion and fun fitness data sets um, and had 14,000 um, data uh, individuals in the data set of data collected in the 2018 and 2019 years. Uh, we had it, it, hand grip strength and a chair stand test. I will note that the chair stand test here um, Special Olympics uses a different uh, chair stand protocol than most other places do. They use a 10 rise, so you stand up, sit down 10 times. A lot of the other protocols only use a five rise uh, protocol. So comparing this data to others is a little trickier because it's not the same protocol. Uh, but we have two in indicators of muscle or functional strength. We have bone density, which is measured um, through a heel ultrasound, um, and then we have obesity. And we used um, published established metrics to define what would be considered a low, a low grip strength or a high chair stand time or a low bone density that would put somebody potentially at risk of something like sarcopenia or osteopenia or obesity. These are screening measures, not diagnostic measures, but we're still trying to identify how many people have problematic scores in these areas that would be in need of education or intervention. So Morgan used uh, um, a logistic regression to look at the odds that someone would have um, a poor health indicator in a particular area between men and women and across age bands. And we used uh, 20 to 29 year olds as our reference group. So our young adults as the reference group, and then look to see if the risk of a certain health indicator went up across the, the aging process. So first we're seeing here uh, for group strength, we have um, on uh, the left, we have the uh, proportion of the sample that had a group strength score that would indicate they have low muscular strength. Um, we have age bands going from the uh, 20s up to the, the uh, 70s, and then we have differences denoted between males and, and females. So for crib strength, overall, 43% of our adult sample had a crib strength that would be considered low crib strength and, and would um, fall within the sarcopenia guidelines for poor muscular strength. Um, that also increased uh, significantly with the odds of low muscle strength, uh, maxing out at about two times the, the odds for those in the 60s. Um, and we did see, interesting, um, a significant um, higher risk of low muscle strength for males, um, almost 1.88 times what we saw for females. That probably has to do with um, the cutoffs being different between men and women and men having a much higher cutoff um, that we didn't have as many of, of the men reaching that, that standard. We saw the same 
kind of thing for a uh, chair stand. About 46% of our sample had a chair stand time that indicated poor lower leg strength or poor functional mobility. And again, that increased substantially with age, maxing out in the 60s around 2.79 times greater risk. Um, and for a very small sample that we had in the 70s, um, almost 10 times greater risk. So um, again, showing um, substantial increase in the likelihood of poor muscular strength as the population um, ages. Again, in this case, males had significantly lower risk, um, about uh, 0.88 times um, the uh, risk of females in this, this area. Next, uh, from the health promotion area, we have data on bone density. And about 28% of our sample had low bone density that would suggest that they were at risk for osteopenia or osteoporosis. And that also increased substantially with, with age, um, going up to about 2.24 times or 3.14 times in the 60s and 70s. And again, something that's, that's unique or potentially odd here, um, our male sample actually had significantly greater risk of low bone density compared to the females. Um, and I have a number of thoughts as to why that could be. My, my best guess is that um, uh, due to either a vitamin supplementation or other things that are targeted largely at women, um, we might not have as much risk shown, whereas those kind of targeted efforts aren't going as much toward, toward men. But ultimately, we don't. And then lastly, for BMI, 50% um, of our sample of 7,800 adults uh, put them in the obese range based off of BMI. While we don't see as much variation across the um, age range, we do see substantially higher, higher risk from the 30s up to about the late 50s compared to uh, the, uh, the 20s. Um, in this case, females showed substantially higher risk compared to, to males based off of PMI. So what do these four areas tell us about athlete health? Well, clearly there are a large number of athletes involved with Special Olympics that have um, poor health in multiple areas that, that we have data for. But we really still haven't, from this paper, figured out how these conditions relate to each other. So after seeing indicators like poor muscle strength, poor bone density, poor uh, body mass index, we started to think about a condition of osteosarcopenic adiposity. Um, it's been called osteosarcopenic obesity in the, in the past. But it is a condition in which you, you see concurrent deterioration of bone, muscle, and excess fat that leads to a reduced in functionality and increased system dysregulation. So it's not just do you have low bone density? Is it just your overweight or obese? What happens when all of these conditions stack up on top of each other? So we proposed a exploratory analysis um, to see what happens if we have overlap between these conditions and how much overlap is actually existing within our sample of adults with intellectual disabilities. So to do that, we, had, we were able to identify 737 adult participants that we had data from all four measurements collected at the same events. And I will point out the fact that we went from 7,000 approximately down to 700 is a severe limitation of this analysis. Um, so one of the things we're working on in the future is to get better data coordination across these areas so that we can keep those numbers high. Um, what's interesting about this group is we see still very high proportion um, had a high chair stand time, about 43%, uh, about 45% for grip strength, 27% for low BMD, and 42% for high BMI, which is another 
potential problem here with this analysis. We went from a larger sample where there was 50% obese down to a smaller sample that's 42%. So we're potentially talking about a different subset of people here than we started off with, which is a, a severe limitation in this analysis and why it's currently only exploratory. So what did we find? Ultimately though, what's most important here, only 3.5% of our sample had all four of those problematic conditions exhibited at the same time. So our initial hypothesis going in that we were going to see a lot of overlap didn't actually occur. We're still trying to look at how to best account for kind of these different variations of overlap in the middle, as opposed to just all four at, at the same time. But using the same logistic regression analysis, uh, we uh, looked at the effect of age and the effect of, of, of sex on exhibiting all four of those conditions. We do, we do see an age trend. Again, this is much more limited by the smaller sample. I can't believe I'm saying that 737 is a small sample, but I'm saying it. Um, and uh, But we do see within the 50 year old age group about a four times risk of having that. Um, I, we think the, we, should, we know that the 60s and 70s beyond that, we're not seeing any significance simply because we don't have enough people that fall into those, those silos. So what can we take from, from all of this? Well, we, um, I think are, are showing the potential of using this, this data in a much more nuanced way than has been done um, in, the, in the past, but it also speaks to we need better advancements within the Special Olympics system to be able to really utilize all of this. All of this data that I've shown is cr cross-section. I can only look at relationships of age across groups of people. Part of that is because up until recently, Special Olympics has not had unique identifiers on athletes. So what somebody does in 2017 is treated as a completely different observation in 2018. That is now changing where we're starting to be able to identify, identify people and track them longitudinally, which is going to make for a much powerful analysis um, in a couple of years when we have. I'll come back and talk about those future directions here in a moment. So on a taking a complete change of, of course, the other side of Special Olympics that I've been involved is in the play unified um, movement and particularly in unified sports. So the idea of unified sports is to promote social inclusion by having competition where we put people with and without intellectual disabilities on the same sports teams to compete against other teams with the same makeup. Um, and in 2021, there were about 10,000 unified sport competitions um, across the world with approximately half a million um, Special Olympics athletes with intellectual disabilities being partnered with about 600,000 unified partners who are of the same age, but do not have a disability. And the idea behind unified sports and what some of the data uh, shows is that by making these partnerships, we can promote the confidence and self-esteem of athlete, of the Special Olympics athletes. It also provides an opportunity for those unified partners to develop positive attitudes toward people with intellectual disabilities increase understanding and have more positive beliefs about the importance of inclusion. However, one criticism of unified sports is that there is the risk of partner dominance. And that's where the unified partner then monopolizes either the effort or the productivity of the game and potentially is taking away an opportunity from another Special Olympian with an intellectual disability by taking up that spot on, on the team. And that has actually um, been shown in some data, largely from coaches' uh, surveys. And a lot of coaches who coach unified sport report that 
they perceive there to be issues where the unified partners are dominating the game compared to the Special Olympics. However, this has not been measured in any objective way to this, this date um, that we're aware of. So, Unified Cup was a international soccer tournament that happened in Detroit um, in 2022 during the first week of um, August. There was a men's tournament and a women's tournament that brought together uh, 20 delegations from around the world of these elite unified sport soccer or uh, uh, football teams. Um, and because this was in Detroit, uh, one of my collaborators, uh, Leah Ketchison, went to State University and another collaborator, Chin and Hout, uh, from Michigan State University and I uh, put together a research team to be able to study the activity patterns of these players while they were in gameplay. Um, and in doing so, we worked with Special Olympics to be able to get access to the players on the field to be able to, to uh, make those measurements. Um, and what we found was we also somewhat started a process to be able to do more research through Special Olympics um, and having them think about how outside researchers can be involved. So we used Actigraph accelerometers that we put on um, belts that were placed at, at the waist. And um, this was a picture that was on Special Olympics Twitter the first day. And we were like, they got the belt. Um, <laughs> so you can see uh, the, the player wearing uh, the belt there. Um, we collected across the teams that consented and chose to participate in it. We, we collected hundreds of player games. So games played by each player using these, these belts. And we um, now have all of this physical activity data of what was going on during the game. Uh, what we've currently done is taken that, that data and cleaned out portions of the game, such as warm up, halftime, any time that they were on the sidelines, so they were out of the game, and we currently have taken the goalies out of the analysis because their activity patterns are very, very different than everyone else and they just cause problems. So uh, what we have done, I'm gonna show the results for the women's tournament and the men's tournament um, separately because the game lengths were different, the field sizes were different, the number of players on the field were different. So it's not fair to combine them or to compare them. So in the women's tournament, there were 12 total international teams participating. Eight of those teams um, consented and joined the study. Um, from that, we had 78 total players that we were monitoring. That included 44 Special Olympics athletes and 34 unified partners. All of them were around 18 years of, of age. And from monitoring the preliminary games, think of that if you watch World Cup, think about the group stage. Um, in those sections, we were able to record a total of 217 player games. So each player playing um, a game. Across that, within the women's tournament, it was a seven on seven um, game format with a 40 minute game time. Um, and we did see that Special Olympics athletes actually averaged more minutes, about 27 minutes out of the 40 minute game compared to the unified partners that average about 22 minutes. So our analyses that I'm gonna show control for game time, because certainly that's gonna have an impact on the amount of physical activity that can be seen. So our analysis here is a linear mixed model that accounts for the nested aspect of the physical activity. So we have multiple measurements per player within this analysis. Um, we have minutes of gameplay here, and then categories of physical activity, um, including light, moderate, vigorous, and very vigorous that were used um, based on, or they were determined based off of established cut points. And we had the total MVPA that combines moderate, vigorous, and very vigorous. What I'm going to show first, and we have in orange are the Special Olympics athletes, in black are the unified partners. So. The biggest thing, if we look at it in total MVPA, kind of how we often think about physical activity, 
they're almost identical. Um, so we're averaging right around 20 minutes of physical activity for both unified partners and Special Olympics athletes. However, we do see some differences when we get into individual categories. So the unified partners had more minutes that were very vigorous in intensity, whereas the Special Olympics athletes had more minutes that were moderate in intensity. So even though there's a difference, they're somewhat offsetting in the bigger picture. And that could mean that, that the unified partners are going faster and, and harder. This could also be a measurement issue um, where possibly the movement of the Special Olympics athletes, particularly if they have Down syndrome or some other condition where the physiological response to exercise is different, we might be categorizing something as moderate when to them it's actually much more vigorous. But either way, I interpret this as we have these differences in subcategories, but in the grand scheme of things, activity between the two groups during the game is very similar. For the men, we had six out of the 10 teams participating for a total of 89 players, 52 for special Olympics athletes, 37 open unified partners. For the men's tournament, it was played on what we think of as a full soccer field. 11 on 11 with a 60 minute game. Um, and in this case, actually the unified partners played um, significantly more than the Special Olympics athletes. I will say one of the big differences from being there between the men's tournament and the women's tournament, there was much more substitution in, in the women's tournament than there was in the men's. The men's was played much more like traditional elite um, uh, of, of football where most substitutions were made so we see basically the same um, outcome here for Special Olympics athletes and unified partners. Basically almost identical MVPA, about 37 minutes out of the 60 minute game was in MVPA um, for both groups. Um, but this time our differences occur in this a vigorous to a very vigorous areas where the unified partners had significantly more very vigorous, the Special Olympics athletes offset that was significantly more vigorous that again, I think all washes out um, in the end. So looking at these results, my conclusion is that um, even though partner dominance might be perceived as an, as an issue, when it comes to the activity that, that's being done on the field during play, uh, we don't see a big difference um, between the unified partners and the Special Olympics athletes. I will counter that, however. We're currently starting to look at things like goals and assists and saves, and unfortunately, those game performance statistics that ultimately impact the outcome of the game greatly favor other, other unified partners being the decision, being the deciding factor between who won and who lost the game. I'll also say that this, these are the most elite teams that we have in Special Olympics. If we were to go to a state games and watch the same competition between a team from Corvallis and a team from Eugene, it might not be the same as it is on this elite team that's involved in international competition. We also, at that um, uh, event, ran a health promotion event. So um, at that, um, here I am uh, collecting a, a bone density. For those of you that can see it, I don't really love the view of that, from that camera angle, the top of my head, that's all right. Uh, blood pressure, BMI, and educating on healthy habits. <coughs> so the next step is starting to compare what some of this health indicator data that we got on the same athletes related to their activity during the game is one of the next areas that we're going to start to examine. So to wrap this up, um, I'm I, obviously I've been involved with Special Olympics for a long time, but um, doing research with Special Olympics has been a challenging endeavor. Um, but that's starting to change. Uh, Special Olympics recently uh, put into place a research and evaluation team that's headed by Andy Lincoln um, and Alicia Dixon Ibarra. For those of you who know Alicia, she was a PhD graduate uh, from Oregon State and still has a courtesy appointment with our, our college. 
um, having access to them um, has made the process of being involved in research of Special Olympics so much faster and so much better. But even they as a team are responsible for healthy athletes, managing that, 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 that data and improving it so that we can start to ask better questions and answer them. So some of the things that are coming up, um, there's going to be a complete overhaul of healthy athletes, including new and hopefully better items being part of those screenings, um, more digital data um, that's being collected and stored in a way that's easier to track somebody longitudinally and piece all of these parts together in a way that it was not possible uh, before and working with people outside of Special Olympics uh, to be able to use this data in a way that's much more consistent with public health and population level data research. Another thing is I almost kind of spoiled the message. There is a big emphasis to digitize and integrate data. So before we had all of these different pieces of data on athletes. So let's say we have an athlete who competes in uh, <laughs> Special Olympics Oregon Games and then goes to uh, the USA Games. And in doing so, complete screenings at healthy athletes, either in the state of Oregon or at those national games. We're, they're developing a system in which we can integrate registration data, data from their training, from their preparation for those events, health screening data that, that we get, and starting to add things like follow-up care, what kind of health care is coming from these, these messages. Um, and ultimately, that's going to lead to more information for the athletes at an athlete level, analytic level, but also building an international digital health database that can be used by researchers without having to fight through and clean data that's collected in a very segmented and very dispersed way. The last, the, in doing so, there, there's also the potential to now combine this data with Special Olympics, with other public health data sets, whether that's census, whether that's NHANES, whether any of those population sets, to really understand how this, how these health indicators might be different from the general population. And again, I'll give a shout out to a couple of my colleagues, um, largely in Canada, because of the Canadian healthcare system, it's a lot easier to make these connections in Canada, but they're starting to take Special Olympics registration data and pair that with local public health data and actually just came out with what I think is going to be a very um, impactful paper of looking at Special Olympics participation related to rates of depression um, by combining Special Olympics data with healthcare data in the province of Ontario. And I really think this is the future um, of where the use of this data set needs to go. The last area is to directly evaluate outcomes of programming. Special Olympics does programming around the world beyond just the events that are held and the big events that, that we see. But we really don't know if a lot of those efforts are leading to positive outcomes, particularly that generalize in a way that we can call them evidence-based. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple of papers that have come out where there have been objective analyses of either fitness programs or um, inclusive efforts or other wellness activities that we can say um, have an evidence base to them. And there is a big need to do more of this and to Special Olympics and especially to Alicia's credit, um, they're coming up with ways to um, send money from Special Olympics out into states partnering with universities to be able to really study what is going on in, in Special Olympics. And I'll credit them for that because in a way it's a big risk. Um, you, Special Olympics has been selling smiles for decades. And there is the, the potential that if you look, you put it under the microscope, you look under the hood, that maybe we're not seeing the outcomes that 
we think we are if we really start to investigate that. And they know that that potential is, is out there, but they want the data and they want this to be um, examined in an objective way. And I applaud them for that. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing more of those activities myself as I progress here in the state of Oregon and at Oregon State. And uh, with that, I'll say thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. So in, I'm actually, well, I don't know if folks have, but I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and then I can see if we have any over there. Because two that came right to mind and things that you were thinking about at the end and, uh, is one, who funds special ones? Like, I honestly That's just don't know where the funding comes from. Yeah. And then a second one is, you were starting to talk about this, uh, like, I guess efficacy of the program, but what it made me think of is, what sort of sample is this? the idea of what percentage of quote unquote eligible adults actually participate in Special Olympics. And therefore, are you sampling a specific portion of the population that is more inclined, healthier, et cetera, all the above? I have no idea. So I'm curious if you could speak to both of those. Those are excellent questions. So um, the first question was uh, related to who funds Special Olympics. Um, and uh, Special Olympics as an organization is, um, organized as a not-for-profit charity, um, but they come, uh, Special Olympics was created by uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, the sister of John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. Um, so the Kennedy family obviously has their money um, that continues to support Special Olympics. On the health side, however, um, the Special Olympics partners with um, multiple health entities. Some of that depends on state to state, um, but the, I'm gonna mess up the pronunciation, Galciano um, Health Foundation is a major contributor to Special Olympics and they partner with the CEC. So there is federal money that goes into Special Olympics to, to promote some of these health outcomes. Uh, the other question was um, related to um, who are these people who are involved in Special Olympics? How, how does this generalize to all people with intellectual disabilities? And you're absolutely right, this is a subset. Um, even if we're engaging with 5 million athletes worldwide, that's only, oh, you're making me mad. It's only a small proportion of the global population with an intellectual disability. However, from what the data suggests to us is that this, this idea that this is a healthier or a different group than the general population with an intellectual disability doesn't seem to be um, coming out given that we're still seeing from in, engage, even with engagement in sport and with um, Special Olympics, we're still seeing lots of poor health. Um, and that, ma that matches up fairly well with other population level data that we have. Um, we just don't have that much of that to compare it to. Yeah, that was great, Andy, thank you. Um, this is kind of something I was thinking that relates to this, that last question you just answered of, of Sean. I was, I had written down, I was wondering if you were only collecting these data on Special Olympics athletes or the broader population of adults with disabilities at, like, are there outreach events, for example, that are bringing folks in to have these, you know, some of these health assessments conducted? At sure, oh, very good. Yeah. So the question was, was um, are these data? I'm assuming you mean the healthy athletes data. Yeah. Um, is that um, specifically from athletes, or are we doing outreach events that could bring in other outside eligible people? Um, how it, it it is organized as with everything in Special Olympics, from local units up to international units, for the most part, these are done at competition events. So 
Um, for instance, when I was in the state of Iowa, we would do an event at um, the large events, uh, summer games, winter games, fall games, um, when we had kind of a critical mass of, of people there. But that is a, a good point that uh, is potentially a missed opportunity to do this at other times that could engage other people who aren't already involved in Special Olympics. But uh, to at, at this stage, while there, there might be programs doing that, I'm not aware of it. Yes. I have a couple of totally unrelated questions. Perfect. Uh, first, I seem to remember a long time ago, there was a, a sort of correlation between Down syndrome and obesity. Yes. And I'm wondering, is that still considered the case? And do you have enough information to be able to tease that out of your data and see if that seems Excellent relevant? question. Uh, so the question was, um, there is data with correlation with Down syndrome and obesity and whether we're able to um, pull that out of this particular data. Um, yes, you are absolutely right. There is a very strong correlation um, between Down syndrome and obesity. Um, even some of the work that I've done uh, with uh, uh, DEXA has been able to identify that it's particularly central adiposity um, that is particularly prevalent in Down syndrome. For this data, we actually can't tease that apart. Um, one of the, the indicators that's not, or one of the variables that's not part of this data set is a diagnosis or an etiology of intellectual disability. So we're not able to differentiate between someone with Down syndrome or Fragile X or Engelman's or fetal alcohol syndrome or some other unknown um, form of intellectual disability, which is a real challenge. Um, and it's actually, frankly, one of the reasons why I get to see anybody publish any of the blood pressure data that um, comes out of this, because if you have a particular subgroup that is known to be hypotensive, their blood pressure data is going to be very different than everyone else's. Um, so it is a problem, and that is one area that I don't know what the future is going to hold, because collecting and sharing data on a diagnosis is much more challenging and has many more issues than other forms of data. My other question, uh, some of my uh, uh, best recollections of Special Olympics are videos of races where one of the participants trips and someone else comes and helps that person finish the race. And I'm wondering uh, whether interpersonal competition is the best way to encourage health among uh, intellectually disabled or among anybody. For that yeah, matter. that's it. That, so a, to, to paraphrase the, the, the question of whether interpersonal competition is really the best model for this. And um, I think where we don't know. Um, ultimately, I think the, the, the goal of something like unified sport of starting to pair people together um, as opposed to competing against each other as individuals um, has the potential for a lot of positive outcomes even beyond health. Uh, what we really don't know is what does training to compete at an event particularly what's the difference between training to compete at track where you're gonna run the 50 meters versus um, aquatics versus bocce ball versus any of the other sports that are offered. We really don't know what the effect of that training is on health and hopefully through pairing the registration data, knowing this person was involved in track and field and this person was involved in soccer, can we start to see if there's one that produces a better health effect than others? But we don't know yet. Now, I'm just wondering, in, in place of uh, interpersonal competition, perhaps individual competition, where you try to improve on your best time, and that's that's what uh, gets you the medal or whatever, as an alternative. Yes. So and and so the the, the question of whether of competing against yourself and improving 
um, as the way to earn a medal um, versus competing against against others. I think I, I think that's built into the 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 training and the competition. I, I will say when I, I haven't been, it's been a long time since I've been involved with the competition side, um, but they do try to group athletes into subsets where they're competing against people who are as much like them as far as age, gender, ability, all of those, those, those things. Um, and I would say the amount of positive reinforcement through medals and um, ribbons and other things is quite high in Special Olympics compared with, with other uh, forms of sports. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I understand your point. I, I think the, the emphasis for Special Olympics going forward is to put more effort into the training process, what happens for weeks and months leading up to that event where they show up and run the 50 yard dash, more so than what happens in that 50 yard dash. Yes. Kind of going back to your data collection process, um, how accurate do you think that BMI is as an indicator for health, specifically for athletes, since it doesn't account for like between um, muscle mass and then fat mass? That's a, so uh, the question was in using BMI as an indicator of health, particularly of obesity um, in athletes, because it, it doesn't account for differences in muscle mass versus fat mass. Uh, that is a very good point. Um, and I would like to see the incorporation of something like um, a bio electrical impedance um, for a body fat uh, percentage um, be something that we include in the future. Um, I would say though, um, from my experience, um, clearly we have a large number of um, athletes that are overweight and obese. And from working at multiple levels, um, I feel like that's a fairly accurate representation of this of this group but that that is a, a very good point yeah. and two if possible yeah <laughs> uh, the first one would be uh, really interesting work first um, uh, how about cross uh, sharing with the other aspects like the optometry that I mean are there merging of those data sets so the question was what about connections between other um, areas of healthy athletes and the particular example was optometry. Um, yeah, so we actually another, uh, there has not been a lot of that yet, but we um, at Unified Cup worked with um, a lab out of the University of Michigan called up some somebody there, uh, but looking at postural stability. Um, and in doing that, we're trying to pair some of the postural stability data with some of the vision indicators that are there. So um, that's at least our group's first attempt at it, um, but there has not been a lot. Better allow a second? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry. Um, the Unified Partners work is really intriguing. Um, and from two perspectives, one more of the social, it's mixed folks. Um, so I'd be interested, um, how, would, um, how would some of the data that you're sharing going to be informing those decisions ultimately to, do we continue this or do we modify it, right? I think, so the question was with uh, the unified partners data, how, how does that influence what happens in the future? Is this something that we would advocate getting rid of or modifying? Um, I think the social benefits far outweigh any of the um, other things that we're diving into here. Um, I think this potentially influences coach training of working with, with coaches um, to properly, um, not proper train, but to better train on how to um, work with athletes um, that you're trying to create one team, but might have 
different competing interests going on within that team. I, I can see that as being an outcome for it. Thanks. One more. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to say I was the director of Special Olympics many years ago. The digital idea for the director's perspective, like, oh my gosh, that's fantastic. Um, question, are you going to track like um, practice outside of season? So for example, the golf team that is here in Benton County, they've been playing for about 20 years. So half that team has played the whole time. They started as young and they play both unified. But they also try to get together and golf at least a couple of times a month. So that, you know, both in the social emotional, their connection and the depression, but you know, they have a group while they play other sports. So okay. there'll be a way to to track that eventually. Hopefully. So the question was, um, will there be an opportunity or will there be within data um, a way to track um training or other engagement that goes on outside of, of practice. And yes, that's the goal. Um, something that I, I had an image of but didn't have time to show was uh, this health evaluation team has created an app um, that players can use to track their training and it has fitness goals. And the, the, the outcome or the goal of that is to create more engagement in sport, physical activity, training in between when they're interacting directly with Special Olympics um, and being able to quantify that. So uh, that is a goal of the program, whether we're going to be able to get to something as specific as knowing that this group of athletes got together to play golf. Um, it's probably week. a little more complicated than that, yeah. but there is an effort to try to pick up some of those missing time points that are outside of a Special Olympics sanction season, the season time. Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. Well, I can say without fail, you are the best repeater of questions. Yes. <laughs> yes. So thank you all very much for coming. I'm sure if you have additional questions, I'm guessing Dr. Pritchford would stay around, but thank you all for being here and thank you.